all things we do and say will be in accordance with thy will. And help us, Father, to take the words that we study tonight and use them in our lives that we, Father, might draw closer to thee. We ask thee to be with those that are sick and those that will be mentioned later. May the Father have better strength and health. May those having surgeries do well in the days to come. And may we be able to encourage them in some way to help them through this time. Forgive us of our sins as we forgive others of their sins against us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. We've been studying about pressing on. In order for us to press on, we need to avail ourselves with the things that we need to help us press on, to help us to continue to make our lives a little better, our lives a little lighter, and to give us strength that we can go forward and do what God asks us to do. One of those things that we have studied in time past is the idea of man of laying aside every weight and the sin that so that will easily beset us. The fact in mind to understand is that we need to lighten our load. We need to ease our mind. We need to be in some position that you and I will not allow ourselves to be dragged down by the things that have been in our lives and the things that we face. One thing that I have discovered and found out a lot of times is that people carry the weight with them of a past life of things that they have done in their life that they repented of, had washed away in baptism, and through the course of their days, they, they don't forgive themselves. And thereby, they carry this extra weight. We don't, we don't need to do that because we're striving to go to heaven. We're striving to please God. And let's always understand and know that you and I, in the course of our days, can help ourselves by realizing that you and I can somehow take these things away from us. Turn it over to God. When God says he forgives, what does he say he does? He forgets. Sadly to say sometimes that we don't. Maybe we can't. But we've got to realize that God will help us if we'll help ourselves. First scripture I'm going to look at tonight is the book of Luke chapter 3. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 15. And one of the great problems that these people had back in this day and time was they didn't want to accept Jesus. And a lot of them did not want to accept what God had in mind for mankind. If you and I cannot accept what God has in mind through the scriptures, then we're going to have a hard time being a Christian. That's why it's always very important to know I need to help myself. God did what he could do. He gave his son. Jesus gave, did what he could do. He died upon the cross. The Holy Spirit brought us the word as Jesus directed on the day of Pentecost, and this word that brought, was brought to us still continues to today. So these three have done what they're supposed to do and did for us. Now it's up to us to do what we're supposed to do to make our lives better and richer. Don't, don't drag yourself down. Push forward. Luke chapter 3, beginning in verse 15. And as the people were in expectation, all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not. John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his flower, and will gather the wheat into his garner. With the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But here the tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, uh, added yet that above all that he shut up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Realizing the fact in man that John had come to prepare the way of the Lord, 
And the Bible says he came to make his path straight. Making his path straight, that's why Jesus, when he came, he could say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The path had been made straight. Jesus Christ came, Christ came to enforce that path that you and I would follow in the avenue of someday going to heaven. The thought in man that mankind sometimes keeps holding things against themselves and against other people. Friends, if somebody has repented of a sin, don't hold it against them. Don't keep bringing it up. Here, these people that had a big problem with John, especially Herod. Now, some of the others had a big problem with John, too, because of what he preached and what he taught. But the thing that I liked about John was that John was preaching at Annam near Salem because it says there was much water there. And it says that all of Jerusalem went out to hear John. And even the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all of these others came to hear John to see what John was saying and teaching. Of course, we know a lot of them didn't like what he said. And the idea of man to understand is that you've got to put things behind you and listen to what's being said and listen to what's being done. Have you ever in your life blocked your mind when someone teaches the truth? Have you ever in your mind blocked something because you didn't want to hear it? Sometimes in life there are those who do that. For example, I heard of a lady several years ago that attended a congregation where they had those speakers in the seats where you could plug in the speaker and hear what the preacher was saying. This preacher and this lady had had discussions on certain issues within the scriptures. And the woman just continued to disagree with him, even though what the Bible said. When the preacher came to drive home his point, she reached up and unplugged it where she couldn't hear it. Now, the idea of man is to understand that you may not hear it. You may not avail yourself to listen, but God's word will still mean what it says. One of the great things in man that you and I are striving for is to have remission of sins. Isn't it a great thing that God will forgive us of our sins and God will forgive us of these sins and the Bible says that when he forgives he forgets which, God, which means that God doesn't remember them anymore when you've repented of them when you've had them washed away in baptism so that's going to go back now to what I said a minute ago sometimes we don't forgive ourselves we need to do that and need to realize in the avenue of our lives you and I can push on a very familiar scripture to everybody is Acts chapter 2 and I'm going to begin reading in verse 37. Acts 2, beginning in verse 37. And friends, you and I need to rehearse these scriptures from time to time because we need to know this to teach others as well. We need to know what the scripture said that you and I might be prepared to give an answer for the hope that's in us. Be ready always to know what we're supposed to do. Acts 2, beginning in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For just a minute in that verse it says, Be baptized, every one of you. It didn't say be baptized for somebody else. It didn't say be baptized for another reason. This says for every person to be baptized, every person must respond to the invitation and do what the Lord says within these words. Sometimes there are those who teach in other doctrines that you can even be baptized for the dead. The scriptures vehemently put that down and put that away because you can't be baptized for a person that's gone on. You can't answer for another person. You're going to answer for yourself. And the idea of man to understand is that we're supposed to do this Volunteered to serve God. Verse 39, he said, For the promise is unto you and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. So with this verse in mind to understand, it's up to me to pay attention to what these scriptures say. It's up to me to obey these scriptures within myself. Just as every individual must obey these scriptures within their selves. Your wife can't do it for you. The husband can't do it for you. Likewise, you can't do it for the children, and the children can't do it for the parents. It's, all of us, it's up to all of us to signify that, that I want to serve God, and I want to serve God well. 
So it signifies the fact that, man, that sometimes there are those who say, well, my parents were good people. They might have been good people. And they might have been obedient people. Now, they have the idea, man, to signify that, well, if my parents were good people, that means I'm good people, too, whether I obey or not. This is something that's not passed down. This is something that's not passed on. They may pass other things to you, but they're not going to pass on salvation or the goodness they had because every individual must obey as God directs. Verse 41, it says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Brothers and sisters, I appreciate and I'm glad they put these two verses in here. I thought it man to understand why am I glad that they put these two verses in here. Those that received the word, it says what? Were baptized. And there were added to them in that day about 3,000 souls. There's been a lot of argument over baptizing 3,000 people in one day. Friends, 3,000 people could easily be baptized in one day. You had, you had the apostles. You had other Christians that could turn around and baptize somebody when they were baptized. And the thought in mind to understand is that, friends, this could keep on going until it grew in great number. And there were 3,000 that were added, so I have no problem with that. But what I appreciate is what he says in verse 42, and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. What does it mean they continued? Well, I go with the idea in mind of what the scripture says, to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together, but exhorting one another and so much the more you see the day approaching, Hebrews 10, 25. The thought in mind that these people here, they continued, and they just kept on doing what God said. They didn't, they didn't quit. How many times people have been baptized and you don't see them no more? How many people think that baptism is all you got to do? That's not what the scripture teaches. Baptism is like being born into the world. You're born into the world and then after you're born, you don't quit growing, you grow up. You keep on growing and flourishing in your life. You get the nourishment that you need to sustain yourself. The same thing is true as if a person becomes a child of God. You get the nourishment from what? Where do you get your nourishment as a Christian, as a spiritual being? You get it from the Bible. You get it from the Word of God. And thereby, friends, as you and I get this nourishment, we've got to keep on feeding on this Word and allow this Word to make our lives strong. But it says they continued in breaking of bread and in prayers, and they continued doing this all the time. It wasn't, it wasn't just a one-time thing. I'm sure that that's why Paul said in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17, pray without what? Pray without ceasing. They continued. They didn't just do it one time, but it's a continual thing. Somebody asked, how many times a day do you need to pray? How many times a day did Daniel pray? Three? All right, there's nothing wrong with prayer. You can pray anytime, anywhere, no matter how many times you want to pray in a day's time. And everybody, you and I realize that when we're praying, who are we talking to? We're talking to God. And thereby, we need to talk to God because you think about a husband and wife, if they only spoke to each other one time a day or one time a week, one time a month, what would that be like? Wouldn't go too well, would it? But the idea of to understand is that our Father in heaven is, is a godly Father. He's a loving Father. And you and I need to spend time talking to him all our time. It says, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done to the apostles. Now, I want to know why does it say that fear came upon every soul? Why does it say fear came upon every soul? They, they feared because they knew that they should obey this. And they wanted to make sure that they were doing it right. Now, fear doesn't carry the same idea in mind here that you would think fear might carry it. It carries the word all, that you are very intelligent in your mind to realize that God must come first. And the thought in mind to understand that fear came upon every soul, what does the Bible say about fear of God and do what? Keep his, his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Not just part of it, but this is our whole duty, because God is our Father. 
So we need to realize that we need to fear God and obey his word. Verse 44, it says, and all, that, that, and all that believed were together and had all things common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Can you imagine, can you imagine the sharing that was going on? Could you imagine the caring that was for each person that was there? The fact in mind that they helped each other, they loved each other, and they continued together throughout the course of their days. Could you imagine what a sight that would have been? It had to be, it had to be fantastic. Because it seemed like that everybody that became a child of God was really concerned about the well-being and the welfare of others. And that's our whole objective in life. It says that they're continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Now, who are those that should be saved? Those that obey the gospel. Those that done what Peter said in Acts 2 and verse 37 and 38. The fact in mind that Peter told them to repent and be baptized, every one of you. And the fact in mind to understand that they continued doing the same thing, continued teaching the same principle and the same practice. Now, is the same thing being taught today? Is the same thing being presented in all religions? Are the same ideas being given as, as the Apostle Peter did on the day of Pentecost and taught the truth that he was given by the Holy Spirit that came from Jesus Christ, directed by God? If it, if it is not done in that way, then it's the wrong way. We need to praise God every single day. Praise our Heavenly Father all the time. We praise our Heavenly Father not, not only by our words, but we praise our Heavenly Father by our actions. Do you know that you bring praise to God tonight by being in this assembly? Do you know that you bring praise to God when you come here to worship in the Lord's name and study the Bible that God has given to mankind through his Son? Bring, bringing praise to God is the avenue that we are to look for of how I might honor my Heavenly Father. Another thought in mind to understand is that we need to realize that we need to, we need to cleave to the Lord. Do y'all know what it means to cleave to the Lord? Let's, let's get an idea in mind about when a young man and young woman fall in love. Can they see enough of each other? Can they hug each other enough? They just feel like they want, they want to just cling on? And that's the kind of an idea that I gather in mind, the idea in mind of cleaving to the Lord. That you just, that you just can't get enough of what the Lord teaches. You want all you can obtain. You want to be in his presence as much as possible because you feel good being in his presence. So let's allow that feeling to be with us. Let's look at Acts chapter 11, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 23. The scriptures get present to us the idea of man about this cleaving, about the idea of man that you and I ought to cleave to the Lord. Hang on to him. Don't ever turn him loose. Don't, don't ever let him go. But keep hanging on. Acts 11, beginning in verse 23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added to the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, he brought him into Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And in, those, and in these days came prophets from Jerusalem unto Antioch. And there stood up one of the, them named Agabus, and signified by the Spirit that there was, should be a great dearth throughout all the world, which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. Then the disciples, every man according to his ability, determined to send relief unto the brethren which dwelt in Judea which also they did and sent to the, it to the elders by the hands of Barnabas and Saul. I love these verses and the idea of man of cleaving to the Lord. Just keep on, keep on hanging on. Keep on loving God. Keep on, keep on studying his word. And keep on building up your strength. But in these verses, we signify and see the thought in man that they were willing to help each other, not just themselves. But they wanted to help each other through this time of dearth or famine. And they were having a hard time in a lot of places. That's one of the things that I love about East Hill. They send relief to people that need help. 
I like that. They care about their souls and the well-being of other people. I like that. And the thought in mind to understand is that our purpose in life is, is to always strive to help each other. The Lord helped others, didn't he? Thereby, you and I ought to be of the same nature, that we always want to help somebody. A thought in mind to understand is that those who preach the gospel are encouraged and commanded to keep on preaching. Keep on telling it like it is. Take the word of God and allow that to be our guide and our director. If we teach what's in this book, we please the Lord. If we don't teach what's in here, we don't please the Lord. And friends, you can't take anything outside this book and present it to, for salvation for a man's soul because there's no other place outside this book, the Bible, that gives us where mankind can be saved. Although those that teach and practice such things, there are those that dream up other ideas. But this has been going on for, for centuries. This has been going on for a long time. That mankind gets to a point in his life that he thinks he's above the Bible. He thinks he's above God. He can go out and he can teach whatever he wants and give any kind of direction he wants to give. But our purpose in life is to take this word right here and preach what the word says. When Jesus told his disciples to wait in Jerusalem for the promise of the Father, when he, the promise of the Father comes, the Holy Spirit, he says he's going to guide you into what? All truth. He's going to give you everything you need. Friends, this has not changed. The same thing should be taught today. The same thing should be presented. Now, a lot of you remember Tom Holland. Tom Holland preached here a while, years and years ago. Tom Holland was one of my best friends. But Tom Holland presented a sermon one time. Is the first century book still relevant in the 21st century? Yes, it is. It still means the same thing when it was given back there on the day of Pentecost that it means now. The word the Apostle Paul brought, being directed by the Holy Spirit, still means the same thing now. So, friend, whatever you do, don't try to change it. Don't make it, make it mean something else that it should not mean because this is the word that we need. We're going to look at the book of Acts, chapter 14, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 19. Acts 14, beginning in verse 19. And there came thither the Jews from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people, and having stoned Paul, drew him out of the city, supposing he had been dead. Howbeit, as the disciples stood around about him, he rose up and came to the city, and the next day he departed with Barnabas to Derbe. And when they had preached the gospel to that city and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith, that we must through much tribulation enter into the kingdom of God. And when they had ordained them elders in every church and had prayed with fasting, they commended them to the Lord on whom they believed. And after they had passed through Pisidia, then came to Pamphylia. And when they had, had preached the word in Perga and went down into Italia, and thence sailed to, to Antioch, from whence they had been recommended but to the grace of God for the work which they fulfilled. The fact in mind to realize that this work is going to be fulfilled by the plan of God. And yes, regardless of what man says and what man teaches, the will of God is going to be done. You can't stop it. I love it where the scripture says there were those who tried to stop the teaching of the words of Jesus Christ. I love it when they arrested the, the apostles, Peter and John, and put them in prison. And I love the statement that was made at that occasion. If this is the will of God, you can't stop it. If this is God's will, you can't, you can't hinder it because it will be done. So let's all realize the plan of God for the salvation of the soul of mankind. And let's realize that the, those who are saved were added to the church as the scriptures teach. Those who should be saved were those who would obey the gospel. Those who had been baptized and had their sins washed away and now were obedient children of God and God added them to the church. Not, not man, not in man's authority, not under man's rule. No one can add you to the church except God himself because God knows exactly when a man obeys the gospel as he should. He knows exactly what's going on. The only authority that I have is to teach this word right here. 
And I teach this authority by the command of our Lord. That it should be taught, it should be preached to mankind, and mankind should understand. So that's why the scriptures are going to teach us, and we must understand and know. We must not lay burdens on people that shouldn't be put on them. Some of the burdens that are being placed upon mankind today are the fact in man that they try to teach other things. They try to tell them to do other things the Bible does not command. They try to tell them to live by other rules the Bible does not command. Anything that mankind does today in his way of trying to dissuade the ways of God is an error. And you and I must be aware of where this error is and how this error is being taught. Brothers and sisters, many souls are being lost. Why? Because of error. Many souls are being led down the wrong road. That's why we realize that when Jesus said over there in the book of Matthew chapter 7, there's a narrow way and there's a broad way. The narrow way would signify the fact in mind that you and I teach the gospel of Christ and that gospel only. And all those who obey and want obedience obey that gospel by traveling on that narrow way and allowing that narrow way to direct every step that they take in their life. Now the broad way signifies there are those in this world that are teaching other things outside the Bible. Teaching the laws of man. Teaching the laws and the natures of what mankind's doing. I have seen a little chart. I don't know whether you've ever seen one or not. But there's a little chart that shows in 33 AD when the church was established on the day of Pentecost. It says Church of Christ. As they go down through centuries in time, off of this path that's laid down, off of this narrow way that the Lord laid down, there are places that go off. Every way, all the way through history and time, and even on up to today. I have been told that there are thousands of different religions that did not come from the Bible. Thousands of religions did not come from the teachings of Jesus Christ. So that's why that you and I must be very careful of what we accept. Be very careful of what we live by. Because the teachings of Jesus Christ are the only thing that will get mankind to heaven. We look at the book of Acts 15, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 25. Acts 15 and verse 25. The scriptures give us that idea in mind, just like I said. Don't put heavy burdens on people. Just like Paul said over in Hebrews 12. He said, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and run with patience the race that is set before us. The fact in mind, friend, we don't need no other burdens. We don't need no other thing to have to look at. He said in verse 25 of Acts 15, it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. Now I love that it continues to say they were assembled with what? The assembly of one what? One accord. What does it mean, the assembly of one accord? One teaching. One standard. The scriptures teach us in certain places, can two walk together except they agree? No. The scriptures also teach us that you and I must be prepared to stand before God and the only way we can be prepared is if we go with the plan that God has set down. So this thought in man to understand is it says it seemed good unto us being assembled with one accord to send chosen men unto you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men that have hazarded their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have sent therefore Judas and Silas who shall also tell you the same things by mouth. For it seemed good to the Holy Ghost and to us and to lay upon you no greater burden than the, those, these necessary things. That ye abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication, from which if ye you keep yourselves, ye you shall do well, fare you well. He tells us in this verse there are things that you and I need to stay away from. And one of those things that you and I should stay away from is, first of all, false teaching. And what false teaching presents. The fact in man of idol worship. There are those still in this world today that bow down and worship idols. There are those still today in our society, in our time, in our world, that bow down to other things besides the Almighty God. Several years ago, whenever I was, whenever I was a teenager, we lived outside of Paducah, Kentucky. We lived in a trailer park. 
My dad worked for the atomic plant there outside of Paducah. And there was a man that lived in that trailer park that was called a sun worshiper. He would get out every morning and do his whatever his ritual was and bow down and worship the sun when it came up. This is true. This man also would show films of how powerful the sun was to signify the fact in mind that we are to worship the sun. So these are things that I've seen in my life outside of other things that have went on in time, of the kind of things that people worship and the kind of things that people do. There's nothing any more powerful than our Heavenly Father. As far as the sun is, God made the sun. As far as those who worship the moon, God made the moon. Those who worship the stars, God made the stars. God made everything that's in this world, so thereby there's nothing any more powerful than our Heavenly Father. And we must obey His will. He then says in verse 30, so when they were, they were dismissed, they came to Antioch, and when they had gathered the multitude together, they delivered the epistle, which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas believed prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words to confirm them. And after they had tarried their space, they were let go in peace from the brethren under the apostles. Fact in mind that they continued, they continued on teaching. As you and I studied the New Testament, as you and I looked through the New Testament, <clears throat> these apostles continued to teach the truth as they were given. They didn't waver from it. But the time was coming that there were those that would arise, some of those Jewish leaders, some of those people of that day and time that wanted to present their own religion and their own ideas. They came into the church and they tried to ruin the church. They tried to make something out of it that it should not be. Brothers and sisters, it's no different today. The same thing is going on. That's why you and I must realize that you and I need to stand there for the truth at all costs. You and I need to stand there for the truth because it is a very great benefit to us. We have men here that are elders, and the scripture says these elders watch for our souls. Give these men their true due. There are men here that are deacons that take, overtake a lot of the work that is done for this congregation, and other men as well. Notice these men and, and be proud of them because they make sure and try their best to know that the Word of God must be presented and the Word of God must be done. We cannot afford to waver. We cannot afford to go off the track. We've got to realize the Scriptures have given us exactly what we need. That's why the Scripture says, in some places, warn people. There were those back in the Old Testament times that were warned. What about Noah when he warned the people about the flood? And they probably laughed at him. Probably made all kind of ridicule of him. But he warned them again and again about the flood coming and kept building the ark. And when the flood came, the only ones who were spared from that world were these eight souls. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. <clears throat> Who were the three sons of Noah? Thank you, very good. But the idea of mind to understand, they were warned. And just like whenever Abraham was told he's going to destroy us, God said, I'm going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. He didn't want to see Sodom and Gomorrah destroyed because he had a nephew down there. What was that nephew's name? Who? Lot. Okay, so, so I'm going to destroy those cities. And, God, and Abraham made a plea to him. If there be 40, 35, if there be... 30, if there be 20, if there be 10, would you spare the cities? And God at each occasion said, if you find 10, strike your souls in these cities, we'll spare the cities. They couldn't even find five. Couldn't even find five. And, and the warning is there. I'm, God says, I'm going to do it. And God told them, said, we're going we're gonna to put people in there. We're going to get Lot and his wife and his two daughters out. And we're going to lead them to safety because I'm going to destroy those cities. And Lot and his wife and his two daughters left the cities. But isn't it sad that only three completely escaped? Isn't that sad? Have you ever stopped and thought about what Lot thought when his wife looked back and turned into a pillar of salt? Could you imagine what, what his feeling was? Here's, here's my wife. And she disobeyed the command of God. She turned around and looked back. 
The idea man to understand that God gives warning after warning. Just like when he told Jonah to go down to the city of Nineveh and preach to the people there because if they don't repent, I'm going I'm to overthrow the city. Jonah didn't want to go down to Nineveh because he'd heard how wicked the city was. God says all people need, need the truth. All people need to hear what the truth is. And so Jonah got on a ship going the other way. We all know the story from there, don't we? Have you ever thought about how quick Jonah headed to Nineveh when he got out of that whale? I've often tried to stop and think about how fast he probably got there. But he went down to the city of Nineveh, and at the preaching of Jonah, they repented. So preaching, preaching brings repentance. Preaching gets people attention. But if it don't get their attention, what's going to happen? If people don't wake up and obey the gospel, what's going to happen? If people don't live right, what's going to happen? We know what's going to happen. We've seen it in time past. And the book of Revelation warns us about things to come and things that are going to happen. This world is going to come to an end. Are we ready? But let's look at the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 9. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 9. For God had not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them that labor among you, and, the, and, and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. Now in that verse right there, I want you to notice why. Why would he tell these people here, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded. Judgment is coming. You see it rolled all over it. Judgment is coming. When? We don't know. Could be at any time. And the fact of the matter to understand is that God is trying to warn us through the scriptures. Jesus is trying to warn all these people. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. Support those that are weak. Those who have trouble sometimes in facing what life holds. Those who have trouble sometimes in being a Christian because of the struggles they face. Help them. Our whole idea in man is to encourage. See that none render evil for evil for unto any man. But ever, but ever follow that which is good both among yourselves and to all men. Two words. Rejoice evermore. Be happy. Be happy you can be a child of God. Three words, pray without ceasing. Pray to God all the time. Don't let days go by. Don't let hours go by. Don't let time slip by you that you don't pray to God. Because we need that prayer. And we need that prayer to go to God. God wants us to talk to him. Then he says, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Give thanks. Be thankful that we can know that there is a God. Be thankful that we can know there is a Savior. Be thankful that we can be a member of the church that Christ died for. Be thankful, friends, that we can prepare for the time to come to stand before God. Be thankful that we are given these words time and again. You know, sometimes in life there are those that don't want to do nothing. You know, we forever, throughout the time and throughout history, we've got people that don't want to work. Like the story I was told one time about a man that walked up to a store, a grocery store. And he walked up to a bunch of people that were sitting around the porch. And y'all probably seen that. People are sitting around the porch and talking. And, and the man walked up and he said, I'll give the laziest man here a dollar bill. And the man laying on the side of the porch said, roll me over and put it in my pocket. I thought that's pretty lazy, don't you? But the idea man is that we want salvation. Are we going to do what the Bible says to do to get it? Let's look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 9. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, beginning in verse 9. 
not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were without with you, this we commanded you that if you any work would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some among <coughs> which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busy bodies. For that them that are such as command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye, brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Our purpose in life is to always encourage each other and to help people in life that need our help. But he says here with the authority man to understand that all need to be workers. All need to be doing something. All need to be encouraged, friends, in their lives to be a worker, and especially to be a worker in God's kingdom. And I ask myself the question sometimes, can I inherit what God prepared if I'm not a worker in his kingdom? Can I be ready to meet God if I'm not a worker in that kingdom every day? If I'm not doing what God says, then friends, where do I stand? If you want to eat, you want to partake of what God's preparing, you be a worker. You do as God directs. But one more scripture that I want to look at is in Hebrews chapter 12, and I'm going to begin reading in verse 2. Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 2. In verse 1, it talks about us running the race with patience. It talks about us laying aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us. Lay aside things that hinder us. Get away from sin. Stay away from sin. Don't let it influence you. Don't let it drag you down. Because sin can ruin you. But while we're running, and running this race to go to heaven, he said, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sitting down at the right hand of the throne of God. Friends, keep your eyes on Jesus. Keep on looking to him. Keep on looking to his commands. Keep on looking to his word of what you and I might obey. But are you allowing Jesus Christ to direct your life? And that's a part of pressing on. Keep on pushing. Keep on going. Don't ever, don't ever give up. But too many give up. And I've often thought about the times in life that people sometimes, they'll be faithful for a while, and then they'll be unfaithful. And they'll come back, and they'll be faithful for a while, and then they'll be unfaithful. The thing that's really concerned me is this. Suppose I take the chance to be unfaithful for a while, and the Lord comes while I'm being unfaithful. What am I going to say? What am I going to do? He says, For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be worried and faint in your minds. Ye have not resisted unto blood striving against sin, and ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as your, unto children. My son, despise thy, not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. How many of you got a whipping when you're growing up? Anybody in here ever got a whipping when you're growing up? And your parent would tell you, say, this is going to hurt me more than this you. And you didn't believe them. But you know, friends, just like parents sometimes correct children, God has to correct us. God has to get our attention. God has to wake us up. We don't know what that at waking up would undertake and what it might involve. But we need to pay attention. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If the Lord loves you, he'll try his best to keep you in line. If he loves you, he'll try his best to get your attention. He'll try to help you recognize that you're on the wrong road. Don't, don't be faulty with that. Realize that the God is trying his best to help you in every avenue. Thank you very much tonight for your kind attention. If you have any questions or comments, you can talk to me. Thank you.